स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू टूडेज लेक्चर इन लास्ट फ्यू क्लासेस वी हैव बीन डिस्कसिंग प्रिंसिपल्स एंड पॉस्टुलेट्स ऑफ क्वांटम मैकेनिक्स सो फॉर वी हैव डिस्कस्ड two postulates of quantum mechanics and we'll continue our discussion by reviewing the two postulates that we already have discussed and then carry forward our discussion uh, the two postulates that we have discussed so far uh, they are they kind of set the ground for our for future discussion for example postulate 1 promised us that if we want to treat any system quantum mechanically the quantity that we must always be looking for is the so called state function or the wave function that we did denote by uh, a term psi the function psi this state function completely specifies the state of the system that that means everything that we possibly can know about the system is out there in this state function psi but the wave function itself does not have any physical meaning however what has a physical meaning is its is a square so in particular according to bond's post interpretation uh, the quantity that has a physical uh, meaning is your psi star psi and this is actually the probability density of the particle if we remember we if we take this infinitesimally small volume and then evaluate this term this actually gives us the probability of finding this system within this infinitesimally small volume d tau and if i integrate this uh, d tau over all this function over all the space available to me that means i go from minus infinite to plus infinite what the quantity that i get is actually the total probability of finding the system anywhere in the universe and then we make that equals to 1 and this process is called normalization by making it to uh, making this integral to 1 we ensure that there exists a finite probability of finding this particle anywhere in the universe now postulate one told us everything that we can know about the system is there in the wave function but then it did not tell us that how we can get some information out of it that was the role of postulate 2 postulate 2 on the other hand said that if you want to obtain any information about any classical observable for example position or momentum of energy or either kinetic energy potential energy angular momentum or any other uh, physical observable that classical mechanics has already defined if you want to know that then there exists something called operator in quantum mechanics so that means for every classical observable there exists a quantum mechanical operator and this we also carried out uh, we also discussed uh, the properties of the operator we discussed how an operator acts on a function when an operator acts on a function it gives rise it changes the function it gives rise to a uh, to a uh, to a new function we also saw that how we can use the sum rule product rule uh, in in carrying out the the operator operator's action on a on a state function we also discussed about linear operator one particular thing that we uh, that i would like to remind you is the when a, when an operator acts on a function often it leads it gives rise to a new function so such a function is an ordinary function but then we also discussed that for a given operator there exists a particular a specific set of functions that actually when you apply the operator on these functions it does not give rise to a new function rather it gives rise to the function itself multiplied by a constant now when such criteria is fulfilled like when an operator acts on a function and the result is still the same function then we call that this function is a characteristic function of this operator or the technical term that we used is eigen function of this operator so the a function is an eigen function of an operator when if the operator acts on this function we get back the function multiplied by a by a constant and the constant that we get out is is called an eigen value and eigen function and eigen uh, value uh, these two quantities are specifically defined with respect to a particular operator we also saw that the same function 
can also become an eigenfunction of two different operators. And then we also saw that there could be many different functions that we can define, but only a few of them or some of them would actually be an eigenfunction of this operator. Now, take if we combine the knowledge that we have from postulate 1 and postulate 2, we can summarize that postulate 1 tells that psi the wave function contains all the information and postulate 2 tells me that if I want to know any particular information, I should bring that put, uh, corresponding quantum mechanical operator. But together postulate 1 post and postulate 2 did not tell us that if I make the measurement of that classical observable, what is the outcome that what would be the result that I would get. And that is the uh, purpose that postulate 3 would fulfill. So, we look at now postulate 3, postulate 3 tells that if you make any measurement of the observable associated with any operator, in this case we are calling this operator A. If you want to know some information about the, uh, the uh, regarding a classical observable that is defined by an operator A, then postulate 3 tells which is which is very important, important that the only values that will ever be observed are actually the eigenvalues of the operator A. So, therefore, eigenvalues and therefore eigenfunctions are very important in quantum mechanics. Why? Because postulate 3 tells that if you make any measurement corresponding to operator A, the only allowed observable is the eigenvalue of that particular operator A, where in this equation A is the operator, f is the eigenfunction and it gives to this constant A which is written in uh, shown in red, this is the eigenvalue and it gives back uh, action of operator A on this function gives back your function itself. So, this is an eigenvalue uh, equation uh, and f is the eigenfunction and a is the eigenvalue. Postulate 3 tells that if I make any measurement for uh, corresponding to operator a, the only allowed observables are this uh, eigenvalues a. So, what does that it, what does it mean? That if I want to make position measurement, I must bring position operator and apply on the state function psi, but the things the, the observables that the outcome of this experiment are pre, uh, predetermined, the outcomes are going to be the eigenvalues of that position operator. Again, if I want to measure the momentum of the system, then I must bring the momentum operator according to postulate 2, apply it on the state function according to postulate 1 and according to postulate 3, the result of this measurement is going to be again the eigenvalues of momentum operator, not any other operator. So, together when we take postulate 1, postulate 2 and postulate 3, we get a complete picture. If I want to make an uh, determine a particular classical observable, I must bring the operator corresponding to that observable, apply it on the wave the state function and the outcome that I would get is are going to be the eigenvalues of that particular operator. So, if I make position measurement, the outcomes are position eigenvalues. If I am making momentum uh, measurement, then the outcomes are the eigenvalues of the momentum operator and so on and so forth. So, therefore, in our discussion, the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues are very crucial. So, we would spend some time in finding out how we can determine the eigenfunctions of different operators. This is what we are going to do next. Uh, in the first example, we will look at how we can get the eigenfunctions of linear momentum operator. In this case, this is uh, P x. The operator is given as P x. Uh, if you remember the functional form of the operator minus i h bar, i is the imaginary root, h bar is Planck's constant divided by 2 pi and the operator is simply d by d x. Now, I want to find out some eigenfunctions of, of this linear momentum operator. So, I start from this premise that let psi be an eigenfunction. Of course, I do not know what psi is. The purpose of this exercise is to determine psi. So, suppose I say that psi is an, is an eigenfunction of P x operator and then this is my eigenvalue the constant and since psi is an eigenfunction, I am defining it as an eigenfunction. So, therefore, I should get back my psi. So, this is the eigenvalue equation that I must solve to get the wave 
the eigenfunction psi and the eigenvalue phi. We will continue, we will use the form of the operator. I would now say that there are some quantities with uh, uh, in terms of psi. So, I will collect them all in one side. So, I take do this d psi, I keep it and then bring psi from the right hand side and take the remaining quantity to that uh, right hand side. If you see this is minus 1 divided by i, minus 1 is i square. So, therefore, i square divided by i is just i. So, I can write simplify this uh, right hand side by i p h bar t x. Now, what I am going to do is that I am going to integrate both left hand side and right hand side. When I integrate the right hand side, I see i is imaginary roots uh, root h bar is Planck's constant, cons is a constant and p is also an eigenvalue which is a constant. So, therefore, I am keeping these terms out of my integration. So, I look, I see I have a left hand side integration to carry out, I have a right hand side integration. So, I continue uh, my discussion in, the, in here. So, when I do the left hand side integration, I get an ln function natural logarithm ln psi equals i p by h bar and when I integrate d x, I simply get x and I should not forget there has to be, there will be a constant of it integration uh, and it, it is a constant and I am expressing it in terms of uh, a natural logarithmic L and a. So, that, that does not uh, make a much of a difference except for that you would see uh, how it would help us in um, simplifying the wave function. So, now I have the left hand side which is uh, ln psi, the right hand side and now if I want to express psi, then I have a which is coming from this term and e to the power i p divided by h bar x. So, now what I got is that this form of the wave function, uh, the, this form of the function psi is actually an eigenfunction of linear momentum operator. What is a here? A is, is, a, is a constant that we still have not determined, but you already know that if I have a wave function, the wave function satisfies certain uh, criteria. For example, it has to be single valued, it has to be square integrable, so that we, I can normalize. So, if I normalize this wave function, I will have a normalization constant and I would use this constant A, any unknown as, as my normalization constant. So, this should not bother me. Then I look at the functional form of the uh, the eigenfunction. It is essentially an exponential function where the exponent is given by i p divided by h bar multiplied by x, x is the variable. Now, and what is the eigenvalue? Of course, the eigenvalue I have defined it in, as, as p. So, I have expressed the wave fun the eigenfunction in terms of the eigenvalue p. If I look at this, this term uh, closely, I see that the exponent has i p divided by h h bar. Now, the exponent is an imaginary quantity if p is real. So, if p is real, the exponent of this function is imaginary. So, if I have a, if I have a term as e to the power i theta, then I can always express it, express it as, as a cosine function and a sine function. And I know what the advantage of cosine and sine function is that even when x goes to plus infinite or minus infinite, both cosine function and sine function are bound by between plus 1 and minus 1. So, therefore, this wave function will not become infinite at any value of x as long as p is real. If p is real, this function is a well behaved function. Now, let us see if p is not real rather p is imaginary. If p is imaginary, we have a problem. What is that? Because if p is imaginary, you would see that i p divided by h bar is essentially minus p by h bar because I am considering uh, the imaginary part of p and multiplying it with my i and I am getting a minus. So, this becomes minus p by h bar where p is actually real because I have taken the imaginary root out of p. So, now this is real when I use this expression in the in the in the exponent 
you would see that my function becomes psi equals a e to the power minus p but divided by h bar x. Now, I have a problem when x goes to minus infinite. When x goes to minus infinite, this exponent becomes infinite and when the exponent becomes infinite, the wave function becomes infinite. But I know for to have a well behaved well wave function, I must ensure that the wave function does not become infinite at any finite interval. So, therefore, p is imaginary is not acceptable. So, the eigenvalues of the linear momentum operator can be any real value between where p goes from minus infinite, p is between uh, minus infinite to uh, plus infinite, any real value is, is, is allowed, but however, in, uh, imaginary values are not allowed, because if, it, if I have eigenvalues imaginary here, the wave function is not well behaved. But what I see is that the eigenvalues of p is a con are all, all real quantities. So, therefore, these eigen functions are a set of continuous functions. Please note that to when I began, I wanted to have an eigen function, but I actually ended up having many, many uh, eigen functions, because any value of p, any real value of p I put in the corresponding function e to the power i p divided by h bar x is an eigen function of the linear momentum operator. So, I have got many uh, eigen functions of this, this operator. We will continue our discussion and look at look for the eigen function of another operator and in this case the operator is uh, L z operator. L z is the z component of the angular momentum operator. We have already discussed the angular momentum as uh, r cross p and if you remember we uh, in, a, in a class uh, in an earlier class, we defined this angular momentum in the Cartesian coordinate. But today in, in this lecture, I am redefining this L z operator. in the in an angular coordinate and this is d by d phi. So, you can imagine if, if a particle is going at a, 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 in, a, in a circular path. So, the phi is actually the angle that it makes over here. So, phi goes from 0 to 2 pi. Unlike linear momentum where x went from minus infinite to plus infinite any value, here the coordinate goes since it is an angular coordinate it goes from 0 to 2 pi. So, the task in my hand is that to find out the eigen function of this operator. So, I start I said that okay, this is my uh, I start with the premise that let psi be the eigen function of L z operator and uh, let me define uh, the eigen value as uh, a which is which is a constant and I am again getting back my uh, function itself because this is supposed to be an eigen function of L z operator. Now, in this equation I put the functional form of L z operator. And I do the same exercise that I did for linear momentum operator that I take the keep the psi part uh, all in one side. and I integrate both left hand side and right hand side. So, I am keeping this constant out of integration. Uh, when I do this, you would, I would see l n psi in the left hand side and in the right hand side, I have i a divided h bar phi plus the constant of integration. And if I simplify this, if I simplify this, I have psi as a e to the power i now this this is the eigen function that I obtain for this L z operator. Again, we need not worry about a because we can always normalize this function and get the value of this a. What I have is that in exponent i a divided by h bar into phi. But here the way we have defined our problem, you can see that here the psi the wave function depends on the coordinate naturally the, it depends on the uh, coordinate angular coordinate phi. But here if, if the particle makes a 2 pi revolution and comes back, the wave function should reproduce itself. So, therefore, uh, we invoke this condition 
this is another boundary condition that psi at phi should be psi at phi plus 2 pi because after making a 2 pi revolution the wave function should reproduce r itself. So, when I impose this condition I see that uh, in the left hand side I have e i a h bar phi equals in the right hand side i a h divided by h bar phi plus 2 pi. And when I uh, solve the right uh, simplify the right hand side I see e i h bar phi multiplied by e i Now, when I look at this left hand side and right hand side, the right the first term in right hand side is essentially the left uh, the left hand side term. So, therefore, what I am left with this term should be equal to 1. So, I define my a by h bar as a single variable m. So, that my uh, d discussion remains a uh, little simpler and I said I rewrite this equation by telling that I have this condition to fulfill that i e to the power i m 2 pi is 1. How can I do that? Since this is an exponen uh, exponential function with an imaginary exponent, I can express it in terms of a cosine function plus a sine function. So, these two functions should be 1. When I look at the left hand side and right hand side, I see that the right hand side is completely real, whereas the left hand side has both the real and imaginary part. So, obviously, the imaginary part has to become 0 and the, the real part has to become 1 and how can I achieve that? It is, it is simple to see because if I take m as 0 or plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2 and so on so forth, I can see that the sine function will become 0 for any, any of these values of m and the cosine function will become 1 for any of these uh, values of m. So, therefore, what I am what I uh, obtain is that if I want to ensure this condition is satisfied, then I have to have these fixed values or rather this discrete values of m as, uh, as, as the eigen, eigen value, because uh, my Eigen value a is defined as m into h bar. So, the Eigen values the allowed Eigen values are 0 plus minus 1 h bar plus minus 2 h bar and so on so forth. So, what I see here that the angular momentum has again not one rather many Eigen functions, but they are not continuous Eigen functions that means, I cannot have any function as an as an uh, angle Eigen function of angular momentum operator rather they follow a particular trend. So, I have this e to the power i a by h a divided by h bar into phi are the Eigen functions, where the only allowed values of a are 0 plus minus h bar plus minus 2 h bar and so on and so forth. So, therefore, the Eigen values of angular momentum are not continuous rather they are discrete. One more thing that you should observe here is that again I wanted to get an, an Eigen function of operator L z, but what I get here is a series of Eigen functions and Eigen values of this L z operator. Just to put the two uh, operators that we discussed in, in, in contrast, the linear momentum operator P x and the angular momentum operator L z, we obtain both of their Eigen functions. We saw that both of them have Eigen functions as, as exponential functions. In one case, in the linear momentum operator case, we saw that the Eigen values are have to be real rather any real value. It, they were not discrete, they were continuous set. On the other hand, the angular momentum L z operators Eigen functions are discrete, they ha, their Eigen values are again real, they are plus or minus h bar plus or minus 2 h bar and so on and so forth and they, they are discrete as well as real. But in both cases, we ended up in getting many, many Eigen functions. This is, these are important observations that we would actually use in, in our future discussion. Now, we will uh, continue our discussion as uh, further. There is an important consequence 
of postulate 3. Postulate 3 told suggested us that if I want to uh, make a measurement corresponding to an operator A, if I want to make a measurement corresponding to operator A, the action of operator A on its eigenfunction, there is an important consequence to, uh, to postulate 3. Postulate 3 said that if we make measurement corresponding to a quantum mechanical operator A, the only allowed observables are the eigenvalues of operator A. B and since the eigenvalues are the outcome of an experiment, so therefore, we are we, since we are going to observe them out, out of an experiment, so we as we would we would assume that A is real. So, if the eigenvalues are real, then I have I have the following uh, consequence for of postulate 3 is that I start from this equation and I multiply f star the complex conjugate of f uh, function and integrate this function both in the left hand side as well as in the right hand side. the left hand side I keep therefore, so in both in, in both left hand side and right hand side I multiplied f, f star the complex conjugate of the function and integrated over all the uh, space available to me. So, in the right hand side when I see a is, is, a, is a constant because it is an eigenvalue. So, therefore, within, within the integral I can uh, rearrange it in the following way. But since a is real, a star is equal to a, a star is equal to a. So, I replaced a star with a and then when I look at this a f star, what I obtained is that look at the left hand side and the right hand side. This is a special property of an operator. All those linear operators which satisfy this, this uh, equality that is uh, with the left hand side is this and the right hand side is this, we call those operators as Hermitian operator. I can provide a more generic uh, definition of this op, uh, Hermitian operator by taking not one function rather two functions f and g when a function when an operator satisfies this relation for any well behaved function f and g we call this operator uh, Hermitian operator. Uh, as you would see that most of the uh, quantum mechanical operators that we would deal with are going to be Hermitian operator and this is what we are uh, going to discuss in our next uh, few classes. Thank you for your attention.